Well, welcome everyone. I'm Bill Antholis. I'm the managing director at Brookings and uh, help manage our, our partnership with UNLV and the Brookings Mountain West Initiative. Uh, I'm, I'm filling in for the other bill that you probably all know better, Bill Brown, uh, who couldn't be with us here tonight, but I'm delighted to be here. Uh, those are big shoes to fill. Bill has been such a big part of this, as has, has Alex, uh, who you all probably know. Um, Alex has asked me to tell you that this is the last uh, uh, lecture for the fall semester, but that the spring schedule has filled out, is, uh, is advertised outside, I think, and the, the lineup is out there, and we all encourage you to, to keep coming back. We've been really delighted with the lectures this fall um, and uh, with the, the great participation. And it's a, a terrific that we've got Ross Hammond here to do the final lecture. Uh, Ross has been part of one of the most exciting and unfortunately not among the most well-known things at Brookings, um, but I think it's going to be something that grows in, uh, in impact and knowledge. It's already had uh, enormous impact in the United States. Uh, in particular, it has had impact with uh, the National Institutes of Health and the National Center for uh, Disease Control in three big areas uh, that Ross can tell you a little bit more about maybe in the Q&A. One is infectious disease. Two is the inequalities, uh, particularly with respect to poverty of, of delivery of, of healthcare. And three is obesity. Um, and he sits on these networks of experts in those, has received major grants from uh, NIH and CDC to do work in that field. And when you see his presentation, you can see how and why it's had that impact. But those aren't the only areas of research that Ross and, uh, and the center have been so uh, at the cutting edge and leading in. Uh, they also work on crime, corruption, um, outbreaks of civil violence, trust in political institutions. It's really an extraordinary range of issues that they take this unbelievably rich and important tool that they have uh, and apply it to. And Ross, in addition to all of that, uh, and senior fellow in economic studies, runs the center. He's just a terrific guy. I think you'll really enjoy getting to know him and him to know you. He's been here on campus since yesterday. I guess arrived Sunday night um, and uh, is, I, I think, so far enjoying it. We're going to go down to the Strip tonight and have dinner at <laughs> Spago and we get to see the other side of Vegas a little yeah. bit. Um, uh, I'm trying to think if there was anything else that I wanted to, uh, what else did I leave out? That sounds great. Good. So uh, with that and with no further ado, uh, introduce you, uh, Ross Hammond. Thank you very much, Bill, for that excellent welcome. I'll try to live up to it. Uh, and thank you to Brookings Mountain West uh, for having me here and all of you for coming to hear what I have to say. I'm going to talk to you uh, primarily about an approach and a set of tools, some of which were pioneered at Brookings, to understanding and managing complex dynamics, social dynamics. And I'm going to use a lot of examples from my uh, current and recent work in public health to illustrate uh, what I'm talking about, particularly from work on infectious disease and on obesity. This isn't a talk on infectious disease or a talk on obesity. I have those in here too, but that's not one the, the one I'm going to give today. Uh, but I, I think this approach is something that is applicable to many, many, many fields. And I don't know what the backgrounds of everyone in the audience are, but I bet you'll find something that speaks to you out of the material that I'm going to present today. So I'm going to begin by talking about what it means for something to be complex, uh, not just in the sort of vernacular sense, but in, in a fairly specific technical sense, and why so many things that matter are complex and why that is so challenging for science, but also importantly for policy and policymakers. And I'm going to give you an example, uh, a warning, a case study of what can happen when you don't understand the complexity fully and you make policy choices that have dramatic consequences which are not what you expected. Then I'll talk about, this is the bad news, then I'll talk about the good news, which is the potential of some new tools, relatively new tools, from complexity science for managing these challenges. And in one in particular that I'd like to highlight that's called agent-based modeling. You'll hear more about that in a second. And I'm going to show you examples of this agent-based modeling from three different uh, parts of public health, from infectious disease epidemiology, where it started to make inroads into public health, through disaster response and evacuation planning, and to new work that's really just getting going now on chronic disease, both obesity and smoking. And I'll talk about uh, what's happened so far as well as what I think the potential is moving forward. 
Okay, so the challenges of complexity. Why am I telling you all about these new approaches? Things that are complex aren't just complicated. Uh, they have some specific properties uh, whenever they occur across the social, physical, and natural worlds. Uh, and these properties, I'm going to give you a little list of them, and I'm going to try to show you what I mean for each one. So the first one is that these are systems that are composed of very diverse actors who are also adaptive. So what does that mean? Well, an example is if we think about obesity for a second, there are many, many different players in the underlying systems that produce obesity as an outcome. So this is a partial list of some of them. Consumers in the food industry are fairly obvious, but trade associations, community coalitions, healthcare providers in the media might not be so obvious. And each of these actors has different goals, they have different incentives, they have different constraints, they have different information. And if you try to intervene in this system, what you do will affect each of these actors in a different way. And if you haven't anticipated how they'll respond, you might be missing something important about what your policy will do. Each of these actors has a different perspective, and the connections between the actors are often not evident even to the actors themselves, let alone to policymakers who are trying to intervene in this kind of system. Okay, So that's the first characteristic. The second one is that these systems are at multiple levels. And those levels are connected with feedback loops that cause what happens at one level to affect what happens at a different level. So again, I'm going to draw an example from obesity. This is a chart that shows all the different levels of scale that are implicated in obesity. They go all the way from the genetic level through the cognitive level, the social level, and up to the policy level. And there are different fields of science that study each of these wedges in this pyramid. But in fact, there are important connections between them. So we've come to understand how what happens with genes is connected to what happens in the environment, and in, they influence each other. And how what happens with social norms and social networks is affected by and affects what happens at the cognitive level inside individuals. So we can't just ignore these connections across the levels. The third characteristic is uh, that these systems have dynamics that are driven by strong interdependence between the different factors that are at work. And that can sometimes produce nonlinear patterns. And what does that mean? That means uh, a chart, uh, an effect that looks more like this curve than that line. And so this is a classic chart on nonlinearity in dose response. As you increase the dose, it does very little at first. Then it does a huge amount. And then the effect slows down. So it's not a straight line. Another example is. This is a real data chart on, the, on uh, mortality from heart disease by blood, blood glucose level. And you'll see that as blood glu glucose increases, it has very little effect at first, and then suddenly it has quite a dramatic effect. And our scientific tools often are predicated on the world looking like a straight line. But it doesn't look like a straight line in these instances and in many instances. And that's why this nonlinearity is important. Interdependence is also really important. So this is a giant chart that the UK government commissioned and put together showing all the different things that matter in obesity. And look how connected they all are. It looks like a plate of spaghetti. Everything's connected to everything else. And those interconnections are what drives the outcomes. You can't ignore those interconnections. Fine, uh, next, I'd like to talk about space and geography. These systems often have very rich spatial structures, and those structures really matter. Again, in obesity, we can look at the exposure to fast food. This is a map of New York City. And the coloring you're seeing is the density of fast food restaurants. And you can see how different it is in different parts of New York City. And these spatial shapes are very important. You can also think about social space. This is a very famous, now very famous picture from a Christakis and Fowler article about obesity being contagious and spreading through social networks. And this is a picture of a very large social network in Massachusetts. And each dot in here is a person, and the links are their social connections. And you can see how rich the structure really is, and that, that certainly matters to the outcomes. And finally, I'll show you a distribution of obesity in the United States at the county level. And you can see how many differences there are even within states in the different counties. Okay? And finally, there's some, some tricky concepts about how the dynamics of time happen in these systems. You've probably heard of tipping, the tipping point. That's a well-known concept. Now, there are others, one called path dependence, that's very important for public health. So this is a chart 
that shows chronic disease risk and shows how what happens very early in life, when you're not even born yet or when you're a little child, can affect what happens to you when you're old in ways that, so it's not just where you were yesterday or the day before, but where you were 40 years ago that can determine whether you die of a heart attack or not. And that, that kind of long time lag makes it very challenging, as you can imagine, to think about policy in this space. So I would argue that many important policy problems, especially those in public health, but any of you who are not in the public health orbit, I bet you can think of a policy problem in your orbit that has these characteristics. They're quite common in a lot of the things that we care about. So why is this bad? Well, it's bad because our traditional tool set, the way we do science, isn't equipped to handle a lot of these features. And neither are our brains, honestly. Our mental models, our intuition about these systems is very misleading, usually. And holding that giant spaghetti diagram in your head as a policymaker is likely to be quite challenging. And these systems also have these features that make them very resistant to attempts to intervene. In particular, policies that don't take a systemic view, that don't capture all of this complexity, often have very surprising results and can even backfire dramatically, as in the example I'm about to show you. Interventions that work in one part of that spaghetti diagram might fail in another part. And trying to take into account all those levels of scale from neurons to nations necessitates large interdisciplinary teams and it makes a focus on policy in just one area challenging because that area is affected by so many others. Okay, and so this has all led to an emphasis, particularly in public health, but in other fields, on so-called systems approaches that try to look at all the parts of the system and understand how they're connected. So I'm gonna repeat this idea of policy resistance that policies that do not take complexity into account may backfire. And I'm gonna show you a, a, an example of that now. This is a story which has nothing to do uh, on the face of it with public health, but turned out to have a lot to do with public health. And it's from an area uh, in Africa in the Lake Victoria region, which I've shown a map of here, that's bordered by Uganda, Kenya, and Tanzania. And Lake Victoria, uh, the whole region surrounding it, at the time this intervention was done, was very poor, had a lot of health problems, and the goal of, in, of quite a large intervention that was mounted in the 60s was to in, increase the economic well-being by providing greater income and to increase the public health by providing easily accessible sources of food to address widespread undernutrition that was going on in this area. And to do it sustainably so that it was a one-time intervention that would, have, that would last forever and that wouldn't need continuous subsidy. So this is a, a laudable goal. And the way they set about doing this is they noticed that most of the inhabitants of the areas surrounding the lake are fisher, fishermen, fishermen and fisherwomen. So what they did is they, they introduced a new species of fish into this lake called the Nile perch. And this fish, which I'll show you a picture of in a second, is much larger and much richer in protein than the native fish that already lived in the lake. And it reproduces like crazy. So this is, the idea was to provide much bigger catches per trip for the fishermen, much more food for the region surrounding the lake, is my mic still? And much better uh, source of economic prosperity for everyone, okay? So an initial stocking of the lake should be sufficient to sustainably provide all of these things. Now there's a problem here. So here's, here's the giant fish. You can see what I'm talking about here. That's a Nile perch. They're huge, okay? And the problem is that the fish are part of a larger ecosystem. It's a system, and they didn't think about the system. They only thought about the immediate topics of interest, and so they missed some complexity, and that complexity unfortunately caused this to really backfire. So the Nile perch, which they introduced, those are baby Nile perch, were so successful that they outcompeted and drove almost to extinction the native fish that lived in the lake before, which I have a picture of in the upper right. So the problem with that is that those fish, the native fish, turned out to have been the biggest predators of some snails. And the snails carry a disease called schistosomiasis that's very, very bad for humans. So what happened was when the Nile perch went up, they wiped out the native fish. And when the native fish weren't eating the snails anymore, the snail population exploded, which meant that the parasites that infect humans also exploded 
their population numbers exploded. So what we got is a huge epidemic all surrounding the lake of this disease of schistosomiasis, which is a very unpleasant disease. So it was a huge public health disaster. And that wasn't even the worst of it. The worst of it was that the perch is so big, it's so oily, that if you want to do anything, eat it or sell it, you have to dry it first. And how do you dry it? You dry it by a wood fire that you smoke it with. Well, that led to huge logging and deforestation all around the lake, environmental devastation. And because there were no more trees, all sorts of runoff went into the lake, which caused algae to grow, covering the lake surface, which made the snails go nuts even more. So it's a feedback, okay? So what ended up happening? Did we increase economic well-being? No. In instead, we introduced this perch. Uh, in fact, most of it was exported. Very little of it was available for local people. And the labor force was decimated by illness and couldn't go out and fish anymore. We didn't increase public health either because of the dramatic spread of this schistosomiasis. And actually, that disease exacerbates malnutrition, which was the original problem to begin with. And there was this unintended effect of environmental degradation and deforestation. So this was a complete and utter disaster. But it sounded like a really good idea. Okay, so this is a cautionary tale about why a systems approach and taking complexity into account is so important when you do policy. Okay? So that's the bad news. The good news is there are some tools to help you do this that look a little better than the spaghetti diagram, to help you make sense out of the spaghetti diagram. Okay? And there's a lot of interest in these tools in public health now. There's two Institute of Medicine reports that I was part of, and lots and lots of scientific papers that stress the importance of these new kinds of perspectives and tools that allow policymakers to take advantage of complexity, to leverage it, rather than being sabotaged by it, as in the case of the Nile perch. There's been a lot of investment by the NIH, by the CDC, by the NSF, by all sorts of the alphabet soup, agency, alphabet soup agencies of DC, the DHS, the DHHS, all these places, in these tools. These tools have a, a fairly well demonstrated track record in social sciences and particularly in the biological sciences. Uh, and they've had recent success in the management of infectious disease, which I'm going to show you. And then there's some exciting new applications to chronic disease, to obesity and tobacco I'll talk about also. And of these tools, the one that I'd like to highlight today is computational policy modeling. So this is modeling that tries to really get at what are the mechanisms that are driving these systems and where can we intervene to have maximum effect, okay? And I want to stress that these models are extremely useful tools, but they are not panaceas or crystal balls. They don't eliminate uncertainty. They don't eliminate the need for judgment calls by policymakers. But what they do is they help decision makers manage the complexity and make much more informed choices. And I think a model might have helped avoid the disaster in Lake, in Lake Victoria with the perch. Okay? So there's one particular tool, a one kind of model I'd like to talk about, which is called agent-based computational modeling. And that's what I'm going to show you today. And when we build one of these models, what we're really doing is we're building an artificial society that lives in here, in the computer. And we can use that artificial society to learn more about real societies and how they work. And we can use it like a little Petri dish to try lots and lots of policies and see which ones work ahead of time, rather than just sort of jumping in based on our intuition or mental models or some data that we have lying around, OK? Uh, so it's a cutting edge tool for this kind of policy work. It's been applied in a lot of, a lot of areas. This is a partial list of the topics that I have worked on at Brookings uh, in this area. You see that they're feel, they're, they span many, many different fields, but they all have to do with social dynamics, which is my primary interest. And Bill told you about some of these in his wonderful introduction. Today, I'm going to give you a sort of whirlwind tour of three of these areas. And again, I'll stress this is not a talk on infectious disease modeling, obesity, or evacuation planning, but it, it, you'll get enough of a flavor of how this kind of modeling works in those areas to help you get a sense of it, I hope. So the first example is from modeling of infectious diseases. Brookings and my center at Brookings is a member of a major NIH-funded network called Models of Infectious Disease Agent Study, or MIDAS. And this has had a huge scientific and policy impact, especially for flu. This group happened to have been doing research this kind of modeling on flu pandemics. And then we had a flu pandemic, wonder of wonders. And so we were poised to, to advise 
to, for that specific situation. Um, for that work, Midas received the Health and Human Services Distinguished Service Award, and actually modelers from Midas were embedded at uh, HHS during the entire course of the pandemic advising pol policymakers on a daily basis and updating the models. So this had a strong policy impact. I'm gonna show you a, a quite an early model from this work before flu. This was a work, this is a model about smallpox. And the reason I'm showing it to you, even though it's, it's fairly old, is that it's really uh, accessible and intuitive and it can give you, a, I hope, a very good sense of how these artificial societies can work. This is a model that was developed at Brookings by a large team led by a colleague of mine. And the goal was to have on hand some good strategies for vaccination if the US was attacked with bioterror smallpox. Okay, smallpox is a disease people don't get anymore. We don't routinely vaccinate for it, uh, but it exists out there and we might be attacked with it in a large, city and we have to be prepared for that contingency and that's what this work was about okay smallpox is very complicated medically i'm not going to ask there's no quiz on this so don't worry instead i'd like you to if you can um, keep this in your mind this is a color coding and all the people in this little artificial world are going to be colored according to their disease state as follows they're going to start blue when they're healthy then they're going to get smallpox and for about 12 days they're going to be colored green and during that period, no one knows they have smallpox. They don't know, it's not visible, they have no symptoms, they're not contagious. Then they're gonna turn yellow, they're gonna have, to have some initial symptoms, they're a little bit contagious. Then they're turned red, and it's really bad, they get the smallpox rash, all kinds of symptoms, high fever, and they're highly contagious. And then a third of them are gonna die and turn black, and the other 70% uh, will live and recover and never be able to get smallpox again and turn white, okay? This is how smallpox works. And we're gonna drop this unpleasant pathogen into an idealized community. Now, of course, the published and policy relevant work draws on census data and is demographically accurate and so on, but this is a good approximation for, for this purpose, okay? So we're gonna have two towns, square town and circle town. And what you're looking at is these, these blue dots are individual people. And they live in households, which are shown by the squares around them, the black squares. So there's 100 households in each town, and each household has four people, two parents and two kids. And at night, they're all at home. Uh, circle towners are in circle town, the square towners are in square town. And during the day, they go to work and to school. There's no school busing, so all the circle town kids go to circle town school, but there's some commuting, so Mr. Green here who's gonna be the typhoid Mary, the first index case of this epidemic, an unfortunate guy, is a, he works in Square Town even though he lives in Circle Town. Okay, so this is the pattern of the lives of these people, night, day, night, day. Some people work in the Common County Hospital and they'll turn out to be very important. And there's also this ominous box up here called the morgue uh, where dead people get sent, and that will turn out to be quite necessary, unfortunately, for, for this run, okay? So night, day, night, day. Now we're gonna put smallpox in here. It starts with Mr. Green, and we're gonna see what happens if we don't do anything, if we just sit back and watch. And if we sit back and watch, you'll see, follow Mr. Green. Mr. Green's gonna turn yellow, gives it to his wife. She works up in Square Town too. Now their kids have it, they take it to school. Okay, and we can watch this spread according to that color code. And the interesting thing about this model is that it's keeping track of exactly what happens to everybody all the time with perfect data. No missing data, no problems getting access to the data, and we can use that information to design better policy. So Mr. Green uh, uh, is, is quite sick. He's in the hospital. He didn't make it, unfortunately. So he goes to the morgue. Okay, I'm gonna spin this ahead a little bit, and I want you to now pretend that you're a policymaker trying to do something about this. I want you to notice something right away which is that even though this broke out in Circle Town down here with Mr. Green, it's already much further along as an epidemic in Square Town. So if your initial strategy was find the town where this is happening and give everybody there a vaccine, that wouldn't work in this case. Remember that long 12-day window uh, that Mr. Green's already given it to lots of people by the time anybody knows he has smallpox. Okay, so I'm gonna spin this ahead a little bit more and you can see lots of people going to the hospital now and the hospital is going to get very, very crowded like this. And then everybody in this town is going to get smallpox, and a third of them are going to die and end up here. So this is really bad. Uh, this is why people worry about something like this. And this is how it was in pre-vaccine Europe. 
when smallpox swept through entire communities and killed a third of the people. Okay, so this is a very scary thing. And the goal was, uh, if you have vaccine, what should you do with it? And you can imagine now, I'm going to take this same community, starting with Mr. Green again, but I'm going to zap them with vaccine in different ways, which we'll talk about in a second, and see what works and what doesn't. Okay? So at the time this work was done, uh, so this is what, uh, for those of you who like statistics, this is the infection curve. This is how many people are sick every day in the epidemic. And you can see there's a big up, and then it goes away as everybody uh, has had it and either dies or recovers. At the time this work was done, there were two dominant policy options being discussed at very high levels. And one of those was trace vaccination. And what trace vaccination means is somebody shows up at the hospital at the ER with smallpox, you figure out everyone that person had any contact with in the last 12 days, and you give all of those people a vaccine. And that worked really well when smallpox was being eradicated in small villages in India. But it would not work. I can't, you know, when I came through the Vegas airport, who knows who I stood within 10 feet of. I couldn't tell you all their names or where they are now. So that seems like an implausible solution for our modern society. The other large scale uh, policy that was being discussed is called mass vaccination, which is give everybody a vaccine and then you don't have to worry about this. And the problem with that is that the smallpox vaccine is a live vaccine. It's not entirely safe in the sense that if you're immune compromised, like if you have HIV, the vaccine will kill you. If you have the recessive gene for eczema, you can have terrible disfiguring scarring for life from the vaccine. So you actually don't want to give 300 million people a, a vaccine for this, and we don't routinely vaccinate children for this anymore, partly for some of these reasons. So the goal actually is to, to vaccinate as few people as possible while preventing the epidemic as best you can. Okay, that's the, that's the nature of the trade-off. So this model used that extensive data about who gave the disease to who and where were they when that happened and all sorts of stuff like that to actually design a much better strategy. And that strategy is to, ahead of time, vaccinate only healthcare workers, only the people who work in the hospital. And then afterwards, when the balloon goes up, when this starts, vaccinate only immediate household members of people who actually get smallpox. And it turns out the number of vaccines you actually administer when you do that is very small, but you get this black line down here instead of this red line. So it takes a huge bite out of the epidemic. Um, okay, so, and this is actually a policy that was put, that an attempt was made to put this policy into place. This is actually the policy that was selected by the policy community, largely based on this kind of modeling work. So um, it gives you some sense of how this can be used. Now, modern day state of the art infectious disease models that I've helped participate in uh, recently are very sophisticated and they draw on data from many, many different levels. They include things like every flight that is, that is taken anywhere from anywhere to anywhere else in the world, all that data is in the models. This is a particular map of all the destinations on Cathay Pacific from Hong Kong. But you can imagine all of this data going into these models so that we actually know where people are going. Infrastructure networks. This is a map of all the hospitals in the greater Hong Kong region and their sharing of patients and doctors. It's one of those big messy network pictures. Social networks at a smaller level. This is a picture of the social friendship networks in a middle school classroom uh, that was actually implicated in the, in the spread of the H1N1 flu pandemic. And actually school kids are one of the primary transmission mechanisms of flu. And so these kinds of networks are extremely important. Individual behavior, what people do, do they take a vaccine? Uh, do they stay home from work? Do they run away? What do they do when something like this happens? That's really important to get right. And we can even dive down inside people and model their immune system response to something like this. And we can do all of these things at once in these models. And we can build very sophisticated, spatially accurate policy planning models. So here's a model developed at Brookings that has the entire United States. Uh, each dot is a zip code in the United States, a, a population centroid. And you're going to watch the spread of a flu, a simulated spread of a flu, uh, which is going to start in Los Angeles here. And it's going to spread across the country. And every airline flight and all the roads, all the movement of people is modeled in this, mo in this particular model. And you can now imagine, as a policymaker, doing things like, well, what happens if we close the airports? What happens if we close the airports on day one? What happens if we wait until two months into the epidemic to close the airports? What happens if we send our vaccine to LA? What happens if we don't have any vaccine and we close schools in DC? 
you can do all of these experiments in a model like this and start to get answers to those questions. And in fact, we can even do this at the global level, believe it or not. This is a simulated flu pandemic globally that starts in Japan this time. And it's simulated how it spreads across the entire world. Okay? And so for international policy, if you're the WHO, you, you want this kind of tool on hand to figure out what to do, all right? So uh, to give you some examples of the policy findings that sometimes are very counterintuitive that come out of these models that are unlikely to have occurred to anyone who didn't have a model to work with, who didn't take complexity into account. In many influenza epidemics, the risk of complications or death from illness is highest among the elderly. The elderly are who is at risk uh, of serious complication. But it turns out, the models show, that if you have a limited amount of vaccine, you shouldn't give the vaccine to the elderly. You should give all of it to the school kids. And you will save more senior citizens' lives by giving the vaccine to the school kids than you will by giving it to the elderly directly. Because school kids are who spreads the flu. And you can stop the epidemic in its tracks that way. It's a very counterintuitive finding but it turns out to be true. Another example, closing schools is another policy tool in the arsenal, and there was a lot of very serious discussion about closing large school districts during the H1N1 flu pandemic, and it's an attractive option, especially when you don't have any vaccine yet, because it's late, and you wanna do something. Uh, and so sometimes that's a good option, but modeling shows, some modeling work we did, shows that if you close schools, somebody has to stay home to take care of the kids, and it turns out that an awful lot of healthcare workers in the United States are single parents. And if they don't show up for work, we don't have a healthcare system <laughs> to respond to the people who do get the flu and who are sick. So in some cases, closing schools is actually a very bad idea for this reason. And again, this is something that comes out of modeling, counterintuitive. Okay, I'll give you another quick example before we, we move on to obesity. Uh, this is a model that was developed uh, at Brookings that's designed to help in disaster planning and evacuation. And the reason I'm showing it to you is because it has a high degree of spatial realism. So what you are looking at is downtown Los Angeles. And again, I know I'm picking on Los Angeles a lot, but it's a pure coincidence, I can assure you. Uh, and this is every road and every building in Los Angeles modeled accurately in all three dimensions. And what you're seeing are uh, people, uh, or these little dots, who are driving along these roads, and they are fleeing this horrific, toxic cloud uh, which has been released on the far side of the city by an ammonia tanker spill. And the spread of this toxic plume is modeled accurately using computational fluid dynamics. And what we're doing is we're studying how to get people out of the city when something like this happens. And things like this do happen all the time in the US. There are toxic spills, not quite of this magnitude. And as you can see, uh, people who are rushing out of these buildings and trying to flee get caught in horrific traffic this being LA, if you don't do anything, and they get caught right under the death cloud, and, and it's very bad. Okay, but you can now imagine using a model like this to change the physical space and see what happens and see how the, the movement patterns, the transit patterns change. And you could do that for evacuation planning, but you could also do it for something like the built environment. If you're worried about walkability, if you're worried about safety, if you're worried about physical activity, you could do this sort of thing also. All right, uh, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about obesity. For those of you who don't know much about the topic, I'll give you a, a short primer of why this is such a big deal. The percentage of obese Americans has doubled <clears throat> in the last few decades. One third of the adults in this country are now obese, and two thirds are overweight. Globally, about two billion people are overweight or obese, and actually most of them are not in uh, developed countries but it's a huge problem here in the US. And the reason this is bad is because it's associated with significantly higher health risks for a whole slew of diseases, including heart disease, stroke, diabetes, cancer, hypertension, high cholesterol, asthma, arthritis, et cetera. It's now estimated that one in every three children born in the US today will develop diabetes in their lifetime. And many of them will develop diabetes in their 20s and 30s not in their 60s and 70s, and will need treatment their entire lives for that disease. Uh, and that may mean that children born today, for the first time in about 100 years in this country, will lead less healthy and shorter lives than their parents, uh, which is a, a real shock, I think, for, for this country. It's also a major driver of health costs. Up to 100% higher spending is recorded on medical needs, is recorded in the overweight and obese. And 
Healthcare spending related to obesity accounts for 21% of all US healthcare spending. That's a number that has doubled in the last decade and could easily double again. So thinking about if you're interested in healthcare cost containment, you should be interested in preventing obesity. Here's to give you a graphic uh, impression for those of you who like graphs better than words. This is the picture of the US in 1990. This is how much obesity there is. You can see that no state has an obesity rate higher than 15% in 1990. This is 2009, and every state has an obesity rate higher than 15% in 2009, every single state. So you can see how bad this has gotten. It's very bad in children. This is the rise of overweight and obesity in children, which portends poorly for the future. And to give you a sense of how global a trend this is, I have a cool little graphic here that will show you the global spread of obesity and overweight. These, each of these dots is a country. The dot we're going to track is this black dot, which is the United States. These are all different dots color-coded by their region. And you'll see all of them inching up. So we're far from alone. Uh, it's particularly bad in the US, but we're far from alone. Uh, all these countries are going up. OK, so the problem is that on one hand, obesity is very simple. It's simple. It's about energy balance. If you consume more energy than you expend, you will gain weight. That's all it is. And it's even simple from the behavioral perspective because there are a very small number of behaviors that lead to energy imbalance. They're eating, physical activity, stress, and sleep. Those are the major four behavioral elements. So it's very simple. The problem is that obesity is also very complex because the things that drive those four behaviors are very, very rich and diverse. It involves genes, it involves neurobiology, it involves family structure, it involves poverty, it involves agri-food businesses, it involves housing, it involves education, it involves so many sectors uh, of our world. And there's interaction and feedback across all those levels. Remember that spaghetti diagram I showed you. Uh, there's diverse actors, we talked about that. And for this reason, there's almost certainly not a single cause of this horrific epidemic that's affecting us. And there's almost no chance, in my view, that there will turn out to be a single very simple solution, no magic bullet, okay? So instead, what we need are carefully considered systemic interventions that address many of these pieces of the system at once in a coordinated way. And my center at Brookings is a founding member of a, a huge modeling network uh, called the National Collaborative on Childhood Obesity Research which was set up by the NIH, the CDC, the USDA, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, the White House, a whole cast of characters. Uh, this network has already won an HHS award for innovation and participated in this, these new Institute of Medicine reports that are really thinking about what this more systemic approach to addressing this problem might look like. Our approach, uh, which I will not get into the, the technicalia of, is essentially to try to use this modeling technique, this artificial society technique I showed you, to connect all these levels. So we're able to model what the geography looks like, like that fast food density picture I showed you. And we know a lot of information about the genes of the people who we're including in our study. And we also model neurobiology and physiology and the metabolism and all the complex biology that goes on inside people as they eat and uh, engage in exercise. And we are modeling above the skin social influences, social norms, changing social norms, changing social networks, and advertising. And we're able, in our models, to turn all of those things on at once and explore how they affect each other and how they co-evolve. Okay, so some early results for this is work that's really just getting going, but we have some results already, some of which are very important from policy perspective. One of them is that early childhood influence is especially important area of focus for policymakers because early exposures and preferences can become locked in. And what happens to you before you're five can end up determining whether you become obese when you're 40 or not. So there's a critical window. And obesity is much, much easier to prevent than it is to reverse. So prevention is really critical. Social norms about both outcomes, about obesity and behaviors like eating, can exert powerful and counterintuitive effects. Modeling can actually help design these interventions. We have some, some uh, proof of principle of that. And effective policy in this space is likely to require coordination between many different sectors. 
So many of the drivers of health outcomes like obesity have nothing to do with health. They're things like housing and education uh, and agriculture policy. And at the same time, public health, and particularly obesity, is a major driver of economic competitiveness, of development trajectory in developing countries, of disparities of poverty. So it's a bi-directional effect, and we have to find a way to not just have the Department of Transportation think about transportation, Department of Agriculture think about agriculture, but these things are connected, they're deeply connected, and we have to start to engage with that or we'll never solve these, these complex problems. Okay, there's a bunch of papers you can read if you're interested. I'll stop uh, and summarize and take questions, which I hope there will be lots of. Um, by saying that I think complexity of the kind I described is very challenging for science. None of this is easy. It's very ch challenging for policymakers. It's all over the place in important topics that we care about. Uh, I think these approaches can help. They're not a panacea, but I think they're very, very useful if used properly. And I think their application in public health is especially promising. Uh, and that's where I've chosen to devote a lot of my effort in recent years. I'll stop and take questions. Thanks. Yes. Could you look at how legislation, as it moves through the process of legislation and through administrative law and into implementation, uh, are there any implications in what you've seen based on your research for that process? Uh, yes, I would say in a manner of speaking. I think two conclusions come out of the research that I've seen that I've done so far on obesity in particular. I, I take your question to be, to be about obesity. One of them is that uh, intervening sometimes, if you want to do one of these systems approaches, you want to try to touch all these threads, the, the best place to do it might actually turn out to be at the community level not at the national level, because it's very, very hard to get the Department of Transportation, Department of Agriculture, all these things aligned. It's much easier to think about how to make a community healthier by pulling on all of these levers at once at the community level. So that's one major implication. But I would say, and the second major thing I would say is that the process of implementation, of how you actually take a good idea and put it into practice is critical. And we need more implementation science. We need to understand how that works because the things that work the best are not always the things that people thought were the best idea. Because when it comes to actually do them, they, they, don't, they don't get implemented. And so we have to take implementation into practice. And that wonderful model I showed you about smallpox, remember the policy was vaccinate the healthcare workers? Well, guess what? The healthcare workers refused to be vaccinated. Okay, so that policy failed in an implementation phase because there was huge refusal of the vaccine by healthcare workers, which isn't something that was taken into account in that model, although subsequent models have, of course, engaged with vaccine refusal. So. Yeah. Well, I've been doing a lot of work on uh, and looking at uh, balance and sustainability, and I was wondering, uh, I guess it, it was very important, you did mention mm -hmm. about the, uh, the economic competitiveness, referring yes. to obesity, but certainly medical care, mm -hmm. because I think uh, that's probably one thing that probably doesn't get mentioned too much. I guess there's a lot of things about being sedentary, but just about the type of, of, of work mm -hmm. and activities. I mean, but it's pretty obvious, I guess, yes. but the economic side of that. Oh, yeah. Well, the type, I mean, you know, people are not <laughs> wielding hammers and uh, that's right. pounding on things. They're either over the computer or they're, they're, they're in offices or they're consuming. Mm -hmm. They're not doing the balanced. Well, so it's certainly true that the mode of activity in which people are engaged plays a role in how much physical activity they get. But the interesting thing is that this problem of obesity really skyrocketed in the late 80s. And the modes of activity changed. 30 years before that. So it's, it can't, that can't be all that's going on. Uh, but you're right that that is an important part. And the reverse is also what I heard you to say uh, is also true, which is that the costs of obesity are not limited to medical spending, but include things like absenteeism and disability, which affect productivity in a big way. Uh, and employers care enough about this. These effects are big enough to their bottom line that they're investing lots of money in workplace wellness and other incentive structures to get people to exercise more because these things really hurt them and their competitiveness. Good question. Yeah. Um, I, I'm an urban planner, and so this looks very similar to um, scenario planning that looks at community visioning. Mm -hmm. and. 
um, land use mm -hmm. um, plans. Is this similar to that, or how is it? Uh, it's similar in some ways, in the sense that the models do are able to identify scenarios of possible outcomes and help policymakers anticipate what they mean. But what's different is that scenario planning is often done in a much more qualitative way. Uh, and using mental models. And this is a, these are very high powered, big computing models with all sorts of math and data in them. Uh, and the projections they make are, are able to account for how the policy itself is going to change the reality that we see now and which policies can do a better or worse job of that and help the policies actually be targeted to the levers that will produce the most, most bang for the buck. In the back there, yeah. yeah. Is this modeling deterministic or probabilistic? It's I mean, stochastic. stochastic. It is stochastic. Models, yes. Now, often when you build a model, you kind of have the answers before you uh, we try not put to it together. Yeah. Well, you know, how, how do you uh, account for that or uh, mm -hmm. correct for that? Well, that, oftentimes that, these models. That basically, yeah. you have an idea of what the. Sure outcome should be, mm -hmm. and you kind of build the models so that... Uh, but we test get... these models very thoroughly. So both what goes in, the ingredients that go in, and the outcomes they produce are tested and compared and calibrated to data, lots of data. So that the proof's in the pudding, in a sense. And if we have an idea of what might matter and we put that in and it fails to produce the outcome that we observe in reality, then that, that was the wrong answer. Uh, so we don't, we don't just make this stuff up. We, we try to inject in it a lot of scientific rigor uh, so that the answers we're getting are reliable. And oftentimes in these networks that I belong to that Bill told you about, there are many competing models all studying the same topic. And we can compare and contrast the different assumptions that people make and what impact those have on the outcomes so that the, the models gain a lot of credibility that way. And importantly, we also work from the beginning usually with policymakers and engage them early in the process of the design of these models and the testing of them so that it's not just, you know, I have this ghost in my machine and I want you to believe what it says because I say so. Uh, there's a lot more engagement very early on so that the models gain a lot of credibility and traction. Yeah, there's always yeah. a policymaker who has ah, the, answer, policy the answer before that. Yeah, no, that's true. You can show them that their intuition about what's driving it is actually not borne out by the dynamics that that, that setup produces. Right, and that's often very uh, eye-opening for policymakers. So. Yeah. But it, it, it is possible to be missing variables and so sure. on, right? Sure. In other words, I mean, obviously it's always a learning process, but you, you could... George you Box, know, who was a statistician, you, you said, said that, that right. all, all, all models are wrong, <laughs> but some are useful. And the goal is to make a useful model. And if you include everything that goes on in reality in a model, it will become just as opaque as reality and it will cease to be useful. So the trick, the art of modeling is knowing what to include and what to exclude. And there is an art to it um, as well as a science, you're right. Um, but we've had a fair amount of success so far. And it's certainly, I think, any model with any kind of rigor like this is likely to be a big improvement over mental models where the assumptions are unstated, where you can't test them and where people often uh, have uh, competing uh, you know, and, and contraindicated contra assumptions in the same model and their mental models. Other questions? Yes, in the back. Um, just thinking about how you can actually implement this. Mm -hmm. You touched on uh, there are different departments, the Department of Transportation, the Department of Agriculture, the Department sure. of Human Services. Mm -hmm. So these are all bureaucracies. Bureaucracies right. have just this blinder view of mm -hmm. the world. Um, they also normally compete with each other rather than mm -hmm. cooperate. Um, if a policy that comes out of the model is counterintuitive, that's harder to sell. And then there are lots of vested interests. So mm -hmm. the Department of Agriculture really represents agribusiness. Sure. You know, so that's completely opposite of what Health and Human Services right. wants to produce. So how do you get this actually all good points. That's why uh, when I said earlier about implementation and feasibility needing to be part of the model, that's very much part of, of what we try to, to understand. And that's what's led me to believe that for obesity in particular, which has such a broad scope of reach, intervening at the community level is likely to be much faster and more successful than intervening at the federal level. In communities, who governs zoning and who governs 
uh, the, the, the supply of food and the supply of exercise and the social dynamics, it's still complicated, but it's a whole lot more tractable than the DOT and the Department of Agriculture, right? Yeah. Sure. Their best interests are much more powerful than people who would have to organize. Yeah, sure, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't get tried. No, I mean, no, but I'm just saying, <laughs> you have to yeah. sell this to everybody. And get, and yeah, but I, mean, I think one of the things that this technique has shown uh, to be particularly adept at is that I showed you, what was it, four or five different models, and I didn't show you any equations. Uh, and I didn't show you any math. I didn't show you any statistical charts. Uh, but you understood more or less what was going on in all of those models. Now, there is math in there, but, but uh, it's, they're very visually compelling. They're quite intuitive. And that means that as a communication barrier, uh, the, the, the barriers are much lower. It's much easier to engage policymakers and community members in this kind of modeling than it is most other kinds of modeling on the planet for this reason. Uh, and so it's had a very strong track record in engaging both uh, stakeholders and decision makers. Yeah, sure. Could it be used to actually organize people mm -hmm. at, the, at the grassroots? Absolutely. Absolutely, I think it could, yeah. And there are people, I mean, I actually, believe it or not, am a political scientist by training. And people do use these models to study um, social, di social movements and the spread of ideas and how you change norms and how innovations spread through communities and why Twitter is Twitter and all these kinds of questions. Do, uh, these models are used for that, yeah. I know this is kind of a different part, I suppose, mm -hmm. but I didn't see uh, energy and the environment in there directly. In which? Uh, in, 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 in your list of things that oh, they're attack. In yeah. They are? Yes. Yeah, and actually, I have a paper that oh, just came out in, in PNAS on a special issue on nutrition, arguing precisely that, that we cannot fix nutrition problems either here, where overnutrition is our problem for the most part, or in developing countries where they have both malnutrition and obesity side by side without connecting it to environment, to energy, and to infectious disease, actually, because the links are very deep between those topics. So, yeah. Anybody else? Yeah? Is this model, does it, does it lend itself to analyzing some of the policies, whether it's a, a Dodd-Frank or an Obamacare or mm -hmm. any of these? Uh, that have social complexity in them, mm -hmm. um, and, and is it being utilized in Washington for that kind of thing? So yes and no. Uh, yes, these models are used to evaluate specific policy proposals. Uh, yes, they can be used to help design such policies uh, to be more effective. Um, however, each of the models I showed you is actually a different model. There isn't just one model right. that I have hidden here that I apply for different things. They're very different models, and the reason for that is that the, the, the point that was made earlier that if you include everything, it becomes very unwieldy. So you have to sort of tightly focus your model on specific questions and specific topics. And there isn't a model uh, yet that I'm aware of rich enough uh, to say whether Obamacare is going to work, for example, or exactly what its ramifications will be, some very complex piece of legislation. But there are pieces of that puzzle that modeling can speak to. And sometimes what happens is that models are designed to, in, in bits and pieces that can actually be connected uh, to start to explore something, something quite complex. And that's actually what I'm doing with obesity is I have different models that look at genetics and biology and that look at social norms and that look at agriculture. And they're designed separately and they can answer separate questions, but they can also be connected to start to get a sense of this very complex whole. Referring to the disaster model, yes. do you know uh, if it was used for Hurricane Sandy, if any kind of model was used for uh, New York City, for example? It was not, uh, but models like this, I think, should be uh, available to city planners to deal with that kind of contingency. Uh, hurricanes turn out to be, particularly water is very difficult uh, to model accurately. Uh, and so hurricanes are, are, are hard, uh, but I think that would be a great application uh, of that kind of modeling. Yeah. Any other questions? Well, thank you all very much for coming. Uh, I'm happy to answer questions afterward in private if you like. And I have business cards here if you'd like to get in touch with me. My email is also on the, on the slide. Thanks.
Josh did like a board briefing on this five years ago. Because particularly.